hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today. Uh, we actually have a packed week. Uh, today we have Professor Trevor Cohen presenting. And then later this week on Friday, we have Megan Threat. Uh, just as a heads up, we will be updating the Zoom uh, invite link. Uh, so be sure to check your email for that. Uh, in turn, uh, Today is a great day because we actually have an alum of our program presenting. Uh, Dr. Professor Cohen has, is a trained and practiced as a physician in South Africa prior to obtaining his PhD here at Columbia in 2007. His doctoral work focused on an approach to enhancing clinical comprehension in the domain of psychiatry, leveraging distributed representations of psychiatric clinical texts. And upon graduation, he joined the faculty at Arizona State University uh, at their nascent uh, Department of Biomedical Informatics, where he contributed to the development of curriculum for informatics students, uh, as well as for medical students at the University of Arizona Phoenix campus. Uh, in 2009, he joined the faculty at the University of Texas School of Biomedical Informatics, where, amongst other things, he developed an NLM-funded uh, research program concerned with leveraging knowledge extracted from biomedical literature uh, for information retrieval and pharmacovigilance, and contributed toward large-scale national projects uh, such as the Office of the National Coordinator's Sharp C Initiative, uh, which supported a range of research projects that aimed at improving the usability and uh, comprehensibility of electronic health record interfaces. Currently, Dr. Cohen is a professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics and Medical Education at the University of Washington and an adjunct professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Washington School of Medicine. So today he'll present uh, his talk, which you see the slide up uh, in front of you. And uh, with that, Professor Cohen, thank you again for presenting and uh, take, take it away. Right. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction, which actually it, it covers a, a little bit of my introduction, so it'll save me some time as I proceed. I'm, I'm going to be talking today about what is a, a relatively new area of research uh, for me and my group, looking at the ways in which models of language can be used to uh, interpret and assess language that's produced by patients um, with neurodegenerative and psychiatric disease. So, um, so this is an overview of what you can expect from this talk. So I'm going to start out um, by introducing the main idea of the talk early, um, and then re reiterate some of the points that were covered in my introduction, just to explain how it is I came to be doing this research. Um, and then I'm going to focus the talk around two recent projects, the one looking at the construct of coherence in the, contact, in the context of patients who experience psychotic symptoms, and the other looking at a construct um, to do with the perplexity of language models in the context of patients with dementia. And then um, before I wrap up, I'm going to introduce some forthcoming attractions. I have a couple of teasers just to, to try to pique your interest in some ongoing work. Um, and then I'll conclude and open up for questions. And so, so launching into it. Um, so this is the, the main idea of the talk really is that uh, neural representations of language, so representations of words or larger units of text that are learned by neural networks during the course of training them, um, learn a lot about typical language use from the corpora they're trained on. And so conversely, they should then be able to detect atypical language use um, because this would seem to them uh, Im improbable. So this, uh, I'm not gonna talk about in great detail, but this is a sort of overview slide I use as a um, as a filler for introductions. We've actually covered a lot of this ground in the introduction already. It plots a path from my medical training in Cape Town through to um, my current position in Seattle. Uh, I'm going to focus on a particular point in time, which is the point in time I was a student at DBMI at Columbia. Um, just to give a little bit of the background as, as to how I came to be doing the research that I'm doing now. So as was discussed in the introduction, the, the topic of my doctoral research was on ways to model narrative text in psychiatry. So at the time I was focused on clinical notes and one of the strength, things that struck me about these notes was that they covered broad conceptual territory. So um, more so arguably than other domains of medicine, the patient's perspective is um, an important thing to record in clinical notes in psychiatry because that can carry like the way in which patients describe their own experience 
is important diagnostically and also carries useful information as it does in other disciplines to guide management. So these notes can include things that are in the world outside the clinic. They can also include things that arguably don't exist in the world, such as patients' delusional beliefs, and then also indicators of potential dangerousness um, means mm, that may lead to harm. Um, and so at the time, the predominant paradigm in natural language processing, in um, clinical natural language processing in particular, was uh, around the idea of a semantic grammar, which is a grammar that's defined that includes both the grammatical role of a word in the sentence, but also it's sort of semantics, like what a word means, what sort of what sort of thing this is. And these were defined um, in great detail by linguists, but it seemed to me at the time that for a model to approach the broader conceptual territory of the psychiatric domain, it would need to be able to generalize beyond what it had been told explicitly. And so this led me to the idea of empirical distributional semantics. Um, I should say the origin story here is an origin story that you hear from a lot of researchers who are working with neural representations or word vectors these days, which is that they were exposed to this paper at the bottom here, a solution to, pa to Plato's problem by uh, Landau and Dumay. Um, and what happened while I was at Columbia is my advisor, Vimla Patel, put this on my desk one day and said, oh, have a look at this, maybe it will be interesting. And that was sort of a turning point as it was in many people's research careers um, of, of that period. Um, like I've seen a number of talks where people cite that paper as pivotal in the direction their research took. So the underlying idea um, of distributional semantics is that you can model language um, or model words in language by understanding the contexts in which they occur. And so you can get from that to a sort of operational or statistical definition where if you represent words as a function of the context in which they occur, words that occur in similar context will have similar meaning. Um, and so this leads to a representation of words that can, generate, that can generalize because if words with similar meaning that occur in similar context have similar representations, then um, the similarity between those representations can be used in different ways. And the ways in which they were used at the time I got into the research were in the context of cognitive research. So to try to understand the ways in which words and concepts were connected in the mind. Um, and I'll double back to some of this research later. So um, yes, to cut a long story fairly short, um, we ended up visiting with Walter Kinch, who had done some of the early research using a method called latent semantic analysis um, in the context of text comprehension. And at the time we uh, interacted with Peter Foltz, who was starting to use this um, method to model language and schizophrenia. Um, and of course, my, you know, I, I didn't mention this explicitly, but my main clinical interest when I was practicing was in psychiatry and you know, that's what I thought I would do. And I had some experience in inpatient and outpatient settings. So this caught my eye and piqued my interest. And, and I'll get back to where that led me um, as the talk progresses. And so um, th that was sort of a theoretical motivation and maybe a cognitive motivation for why these distributed representations of words or word vectors that are learned by methods like latent semantic analysis are appealing. But there's also a more direct pragmatic motivation which relates to the idea of generalization that I introduced. And, and so um, uh, this is illustrated in these diagrams. So if you had to think from a machine learning perspective, if you're representing language in a way that each word is an independent feature, then the representation of um, a sentence that's encountered during training might look like this if the word doctor is encountered, but in the test set, if you see the word physician, um, the representation would look like that. If these are vectors, they're orthogonal to one another, right? they have nothing in common. There's no way for the model to recognize that this word is related to that word. But if we have a good distributional representation of these words, the model can then generalize and say, well, I've seen something that I haven't, I haven't seen this exactly, but I've seen something that looks like it and start to draw conclusions. And, you know, that pragmatic motivation, I think, is largely responsible for the rise of distributed representations, which people are these days are calling embeddings, 
um, as a fundamental representational paradigm in natural language processing. Okay, so this is just a I guess an, an image from my doctoral work where you can see how I was able to use word vectors learned with latent semantic analysis to find things that were related to um, things that suggest or to words that suggest potential dangerousness. And on the right here, I'm illustrating an interface that we built that try to use this mechanism to simulate the way in which expert psychiatrists organize um, content in their, in their minds. Um, and build that into an interface to help uh, psychiatrists who were trainees or trainee psychiatrists to organize information in the same way. Um, and since then, I think it's fair to say that this idea of uh, distributed representations or vector representations has been a core methodological focus of my work and the work of my group. And we've looked at things like uh, how to represent concepts and relations that are extracted from the biomedical literature in a vector space in a way that facilitates approximate reasoning in the space. Um, lately, we've been looking at ways to represent adverse event reports for the purpose of post-marketing drug surveillance. Um, I'm not going to talk about any of that today. I'm going to um, double back to this work that we discussed with Peter Fultz when we visited in Colorado, which is the idea of using um, word vectors to model coherence in schizophrenia. Okay, so I'm fast forwarding now um, to 2018, uh, where I have just started a new faculty position at the University of Washington in Seattle, having got out of Dodge and left my former position at Texas and, and joined the faculty here. So um, as you probably know, uh, the University of Washington um, is a really um, exciting and interesting place to do biomedical informatics research. We now have two former DBMI faculties, so you could say our DBMI number is two, Adam Wilcox, who was also a DBMI grad, is there. Um, and so when I was visiting the University of Washington, you know, one of the things I researched was whether or not this would be a good place to build out a program of informatics research in mental health. So I had this uh, desire to bring my methodological work back towards my main clinical interest in psychiatry. And so one of the people I discovered in my research was Draw Ben Ziv, who's the director of a center called the Bright Center, of which I'm now a, a proud member. And this center does a lot of interesting research in the context of mobile, the use of mobile devices to support mental, um, mental health. Um, in particular, they then work with people with serious mental illness, so things like um, schizophrenia. And one of the ongoing grants at the point in which I arrived um, was looking at the, the construct of auditory hallucinations, so auditory verbal hallucinations of the experience of hearing voices that other people can't hear. Now, um, it's particularly hard in a virtual environment because um, it's just easier to multitask. So we ask that you pretend that you got on a plane and you flew to Washington. And right, is everyone hearing? Is everyone hearing that? Okay, so um, it's kind of uh, very timely. That, so uh, anyhow, I'm glad everyone could hear that. It wasn't just me. The experience of an auditory verbal hallucination is hearing voices that nobody else can hear. Um, and there's a continuum. So this was always thought to be a, a cardinal symptom of schizophrenia. Um, well, I suppose it is, right? Like hearing voices is one of the cardinal symptoms, but it turns out when people have looked more closely at this phenomenon, that there's a range of experience that not everyone who hears voices has schizophrenia or meets the diagnostic criteria. And also people function at, at different levels. So there's some people who get along in their lives just fine and hear voices. And there are other people for whom this is a debilitating experience. And the point of the grant was to try to understand that and the way in which they went about it was to recruit large numbers of participants and then uh, use um, a mobile app to track their experience with ecological momentary assessments um, as well as with sensing interesting sensing technology um, but the part that caught my attention was this idea of an audio diary where participants were asked to record their descriptions of the experience of hearing voices in real time in the place in which it occurs. Um, and we were able to obtain some funding through an administrative supplement mechanism to study 
the coherence of those recordings. And so this is a slightly adapted version of the main idea of the talk, which is that neural word representation, neural word embeddings learn vector representations of words, um, such that words that are related to one another will have similar vector representations. And so if you flip that around, that means that ideas that are unrelated to one another should have dissimilar vector representations, and maybe that's a way to quantify coherence. So um, to illustrate how that would work in schizophrenia, I've taken an excerpt from um, a, a highly recommended book, a book that I'd really recommend to anyone who's interested in understanding the lived experience of patients with schizophrenia, The Center Cannot Hold by Alan Sachs. Um, and the excerpt that I've used is her recollection of something she said during the course of a psychotic episode. And so if we wanted to measure the coherence of this, using a distributional method, what we would do is break the text up into units. So the units could be sentence sized or phrase sized or word sized, I've used sentences here. And then we'd measure how related these um, sentences are to one another. And so when I was constructing the slides, I used a server um, that hosts a number of latent semantic analysis methods at the University of Colorado that's um, I think was actually in operation back when I originally um, looked into the method. So it's kind of a long running server. It's a convenient way to use some of the latent semantic analysis spaces that have track record in the literature to measure similarity or to play around with these methods. And what you can see as you look at the numbers here is that the measured similarity or relatedness between the first two sentences is much lower than that between the other sentences. And you can see why that might be if you look at the sentences. So this says the memo, the memo materials have been infiltrated and then we jump from that to they're jumping around, but it isn't clear what's jumping around or you know why memo materials might be jumping. Um, whereas the connections between the next two sentences are a little stronger, whereas here we have they're jumping around and there's a connection to um, the broad jump. And then from here, um, it's interesting that this is so high, like maybe the jumping and falling were tied together by the model, but actually this is what's called in psychiatry a clang association in part where an association is drawn between things that sound alike, which can often um, be the connection that's drawn between successive utterances with patients who are experiencing a psychotic episode. So um, the original work on this from back in 2007 found that this um, way of estimating coherence corresponded to the judgment of clinicians when they were determining the extent to which patients were experiencing what's called thought disorder. So here you can see in this graph that the patients who were judged to have higher thought disorder have lower coherence in general. And also there's a certain point in the sequence of the words that they utter in which there's a sort of precipitous drop of coherence. And so there's a point of least coherence here, which is much lower than anything that is um, observed in on average across the people who were judged not to have as high thought disorder. Um, and this idea that the, the point of lowest coherence could be indicative um, of thought disorder is something that's been picked up in more recent work looking at the use of machine learning models to predict which patients at high risk will go on to develop a psychotic episode. And so this is um, an interesting predictive modeling app, um, application of the construct of coherence as measured using latent semantic analysis. And the early work on this, which uh, you, you may have come across because it got a lot of press, showed that in a small group of 34 participants, the five participants who converted from being high risk to a full-blown psychotic episode um, could be identified with perfect accuracy in a leave one out cross-validation configuration. Of course, very small data set, but nonetheless um, impressive and eye-catching. Um, and then to me, you, you know, maybe even more interesting than that is some subsequent work in which this approach was applied in conjunction with some other features. I, I should just to be clear, the, the coherence is not the only feature that's used. There are other features, like here you can see maximum phrase length. But um, what was maybe even stronger about this work is that not only were the results shown 
um, not only were these features shown to be predictive in a larger corpus, but also the model that was trained on um, participants who were from one setting with language corrected, collected using one um, experimental protocol were then applied to the previous group of participants from another setting uh, where the language was, collect was collected in one hour long interview. So entirely different experimental protocol, but there was still some generalization across those populations and settings. So um, one of the recurring themes, if you um, read around research in the space, so research in which predictive models have been constructed in psychiatry to try to, to, try to make diagnostic or prognostic inferences is that um, we need a larger sample to establish the generalizability of our findings. And one reason for this is that there are practical constraints around the ways in which data are gathered, where if data are gathered in the context of a clinical setting, using a, an experienced clinical interviewer or a specially trained interviewer, um, that places hard constraints around the number of participants that can be recruited. And um, one way around this, of course, is to collect data using mobile devices um, along the lines of the work that was conducted in the Bright Center. And so the audio diary mechanism that I introduced a few slides back was a component. You know, it wasn't the main component, but it was one of many components of the app that was used to collect data from participants experiencing auditory verbal hallucinations. And so an advantage of this, of course, is that the data can be collected, they can be collected in real time. So a person might not be hearing voices when they visit the clinic, but you know, they may experience them at certain points in the day and their recollection of them is clearer or even data can be collected as they're hearing the voices sometimes. Um, and you know, aside from that, sort of ability to capture data in a naturalistic setting as the experience is occurring. The other advantage, of course, is that more participants can be recruited. And so the data that we had available for analysis um, were the data at that point that had been collected up to November of 2019. And these were data from 202 participants and around 2000 recordings. So we have many more recordings now, but these are the data that were used for the work that I'll be discussing. And so the data were collected in this way, the audio diary would prompt for an entry four times a day during the course of the study. Um, it would also allow for recording directly on demand so people could record their description of their experiences as they were occurring, even if it wasn't when prompting occurred and the recordings lasted up to three minutes. And over here, you can see the prompt for the recording. Um, that would pop up on people's cell phones. So um, the first thing that we wanted to try to do with these data was develop an idea around global coherence. So the way in which coherence had been modeled up to this point um, was on the basis of a sequence. So I showed you a sequence of sentences where we looked to see if the previous thing um, that was said was related to the subsequent thing that was said. And that's been the predominant framework that's been used to model coherence for um, machine learning purposes. And, but uh, we had this idea that it might also be interesting to look at the global organization of the text. So to see how things that were said relate to the central meaning of a text, which can be modeled with vectors geometrically as the vector average or the centroid. And, and so I'm going to move in now to discussing some work by George Wager, who um, presented this work at AMIA this year, looking at the, the relative value of a sort of centroid-based measure as opposed to a sequential measure of coherence in, in this particular data set. And so the way we went about comparing these methods was to um, sampled the data. So we had 1,868 recordings. We sampled, um, we limit those to recordings of 30 seconds or more because we found that the shorter recordings often didn't contain content. They might've been triggered accidentally. Um, and we took up to three per participant sampled at random. And then we had those professionally transcribed and found that of those professional transcriptions, 310 transcripts had interpretable content. And then we, an we annotated those, so two annotators annotated those transcripts for the construct of coherent, uh, excuse me, of derailment, um, which is 
um, the tendency, derailment has to do with the tendency of language to, to sort of slip away further and further from um, the previously used language. And, and so to do so, we used a scale um, for, called the TOLD, or the Thought and Language Disorder Scale, and we adapted it to annotate these transcripts. And this gives an overview of the, of the annotations um, where this is the mean score. It's a zero to four scale. So this is the mean score across two annotators. The annotators agreed with one another with a quadratic kappa of 0.71. Um, and then once we had these annotations, we were able to apply a range of different measures of coherence to the transcripts and look to see how they aligned with our human judges. And um, we looked at this in two ways. So we looked, um, and, the, and I guess our choice our choice of metrics for evaluation was maybe guided by the clinical utility of being able to identify severe cases, and then also a desire to see um, overall how the metrics aligned with human judgment. And so for the severe cases, we looked to see um, if you ranked ordered all of the transcripts by the automatically estimated coherence metric, how many of them were rated by human judges on average um, or where the, where the small number that were rated as severely derailed by human annotators uh, appeared in the lists of ranked ordered um, transcripts. And this allowed us to calculate an area under the receiver operating characteristic curve. And then we also looked at the overall correlation with human judgments or average human judgment of the coherence metrics, which um, gave us a much larger, I guess, a sense of the whole spectrum of coherence, how the metric agreed with human judgments. So I'm not gonna go into this in great detail because of time constraints, but there are a number of different modeling decisions that um, we felt hadn't been explored extensively in the previous literature. So aside from our main question of, are we interested in sequential or global coherence? Um, there's also the question of what unit of analysis to use so you can, cut up the text in different ways and measure the similarity between those units. And then there was the question of lemmatization, which had been used in some previous work. There was the question of whether to use latent semantic analysis or the neural word embeddings that have come to predominate as uh, word representations. Um, and then the question of whether to use the smaller corpus that had a long research track record as a basis for learning these representations or to use the much larger corpora that have become um, again, predominant with the rise of neural word embeddings. And then there's the question of, well, across all of these different coherence measures in a transcript, how do you aggregate them? And it's um, been typical in prior research just to take the point of least coherence. We also looked at the average coherence. So um, very briefly, we found distinct advantages for some of these modeling approaches that are described in more detail in the paper. Maybe the one that's interesting is that um, to mention is that there was no inherent advantage for neural word embeddings over latent semantic analysis. It, it, if you train them both on the same small co corpus, we actually got better agreement with human judgment with the LSA. But once you scale up to the large corpora that are easy to scale up to with neural word embeddings because they're efficient to train, um, they ended up being um, better aligned with human judgment. So, and then as we found as previous researchers have found that the minimum is a useful aggregation metric. But the, the main finding I wanna draw your attention to is that across both of these types of evaluations, the detection of um, severe cases and the overall correlation, the approaches that we used of looking at the relationship to the, cent the centroid, um, tended to align better with human judgment than the sequence to sequence approaches. So we don't know yet if this is a distinct, you know, this is this something that would only be observed in our data. Um, it may be the case that the fact that these are short recordings that can cover a range of topics makes the centroid measures a better, um, better approximate human judgments, but um, we thought this was an interesting observation. One point I didn't um, describe previously is that we had two variants of the centroid measures. The one calculated the centroid across all of the text and the other had a sort of running average of the centroid and th those seemed to work. The, the running average based measure seemed to perform slightly better in terms of overall alignment with human judgments. 
Um, and then the other observation to note was that the size of the unit of text that was used um, also related to alignment with human judgment, where um, for the severe cases, the sentence level metrics performed better. And for the overall alignment with human judgment, using smaller units like word level, um, word level units performed better. So to um, describe some main points emerging from this research. So we developed a, a different way of looking at coherence, looking at global coherence as a, as a complement, I'd say, to the sequential measures that have been used previously. And these centroid-based measures, so potential in the context of the sorts of short recordings we had in our data set um, that were collected in naturalistic setting with smartphone devices, providing a way to negotiate the constraints on data collection that have limited the size of um, samples in previous research. Uh, of course, um, uh, an obvious limitation of this research is that we only looked at comparison with human judgment of coherence. We didn't try to predict any downstream um, outcomes. Um, although we have found subsequently in the context of this data set and in other data set that the centroid based measures seem to also correlate better with rating scales um, using validated instruments of psychotic symptoms. So the next step in this research is we'd like to try to get past another barrier to the broader deployment of these methods, which has to do with the need for manual transcription, which is uh, slow and expensive and also raises privacy constraints um, because people are expressing their personal thoughts and may not want those to go to a transcription service. So we're, we're looking to see how robust these measures are to errors that are introduced during speech recognition. We're also looking at the construct of coherence beyond schizophrenia, and we're looking at ways to model other deficits that are uh, prominent in patients with schizophrenia, such as the ability to interpret um, emotion accurately. Okay, so now I I'm going to jump, um, you know, hopefully this is not too incoherent, like we're in the same general space of using neural language representations to detect uh, diagnostic differences, but in this case we're looking at neural language models, which are models that are trained to predict the next word in a sequence given all of the previous words in a sequence. And, um, and the point at which we entered this research, so this is research conducted with Sergei Pakumov um, at the University of Minnesota. The point at which we approached this research, it was clear that these neural language models could be used to accurately distinguish between text from people with dementia and people without dementia, but it wasn't clear why this was the case. And so, with large um, deep learning models, there's always the worry that they're somehow overfitting to something in the data set that isn't the thing you're trying to model. And so this is some work we presented at uh, ACL last year. So the main idea here in its current form is that neural language models can learn to predict the probability of um, things occurring in sequence. And then we can flip that around and say, well, the model should then find sequences that don't occur in the training data to be improbable. So if there's atypical language use, they should find that to be improbable. Um, and then maybe a third tweak here is that, well, if you have a model that's trained on language from healthy participants, it should find language produced by people with dementia in this case to be surprising, or you could say perplexing. Um, and if you have a model that's trained on participants, on language from participants with dementia, it may find the normal language to be the language produced by people without this deficit to be surprising or perplexing. So um, the motivation for this work has to do with Alzheimer's disease, which as you probably know is highly prevalent and doesn't have a cure at present. Um, but there's a fair amount of research around uh, the experience of people with Alzheimer's disease that suggests that it would be helpful to diagnose it earlier. So not even would people like it to be diagnosed earlier, but there are also um, personal benefits because it's difficult for caregivers not to know why it is that a patient is experiencing, say, memory loss. Um, and so it allows for uh, better planning. Um, and there are also societal benefits in terms of reduced emergency room visits and so on that can be attained with earlier diagnosis. And, and so one way to diagnose dementia is to look at spoken language. So just as in psychiatry, a cognitive status is apparent in spoken language and a tool that's been used to elicit this 
is um, the picture description task. So this is one of many tools, but here, if you look at this picture um, from, you know, I mean, if you'll pardon the, if you'll pardon the stereotypical gender roles in this picture, like there is actually a version of the picture that is a bit more uh, 2020 and a bit less 1950, but this is the most widely used version of the picture where you can see um, a mother in the kitchen watching dishes as her badly behaved children try to sneak up in a, on a precariously balanced chair and steal cookies from the cookie jar. Um, and so there are a lot of details in this picture and the task that would be given to a participant would be to describe it while they're looking at it. Um, and there is, I guess, what you could say a fair amount of data if, if you're um, used to working in the context of like biomedical pr predictive modeling where data are hard to come by. So there are a fair amount of data of transcripts of people describing these this picture um, that are available through uh, through Dementia Bank. And um, the recordings are available, but also the transcribed speech. And so they're readily available for automated analysis. And there's been a fair amount of research trying to use supervised machine learning to distinguish between transcripts that come from people with Alzheimer's disease dementia and um, transcripts that come from healthy controls. And this is a, a broad overview of that. And maybe the main thing to notice is that a range of methods have been applied in yellow. A range of different features have been used, um, you know, ranging from um, relatively small numbers of features to orders of magnitude more features than there are training examples in the set. Uh, the training and validation splits are often different across papers, which makes it difficult to compare them. And the metrics that are reported are also different across papers. Um, and then also, if you look, you can see a sort of progression that mirrors the general progression in natural language processing from deliberately engineered features to features that are learned with deep learning methods. So um, the work that we were drawn to takes a different approach where it looks at the perplexity of a language model as an individual feature um, to use to try to distinguish between these samples. So the, the perplexity of a language model is, um, you could say colloquially, how surprised the model was by the text it encountered. So it's predicting the word that occurs in sequence. If it thought that the word that actually occurred in sequence was very improbable, um, that will register as high perplexity. And there, there is an interesting dichotomy um, when it comes to perplexity in research on Alzheimer's disease, where there's some research that showed if you study a single person, like an, an author, for example, and you look at their language use over time, it becomes progressively more constrained, less perplexing and less surprising um, because their ability to access terms that are infrequent um, is reduced as the disease progresses. And so um, like one way to think of this maybe would be if you think of a semantic network that has leaf nodes and you can think of Alzheimer's disease as sort of pruning the leaf nodes as it progresses towards the center of the semantic network. Um, and so there is this phenomenon of vocabulary becoming more constrained as the disease progresses. But it's also the case that if you train a language model on text from healthy participants, it finds participants with um, dementia to use language in ways that's more surprising to it. And so this has been looked at with traditional language models where you're looking at n-grams as a way to calculate perplexity, but um, the work that caught our eye was using neural language models to do this. Uh, and in this work, a long short-term memory network, which is a type of recurrent neural network, was trained on Dementia Bank. Um, in fact, two networks were trained, one network on patients with dementia, on text from patients with dementia, the other on healthy controls. And then the difference between the perplexities from those models was used to categorize um, unseen transcripts as to whether or not they were produced by participants with a diagnosis of dementia. And this attained a very impressive area under the curve of 0.92 in leaf one out cross validation. Um, as it happens, we discovered this paper just as we were about to submit another paper. We, we had a also impressive but slightly less impressive performance using just a single um, neural language model and a, you know comparing a range of different embedding approaches. But we, we were, I guess, we were motivated by this 
not to submit this paper and to dive more deeply into this paired perplexity approach. So you might say, well, we have an AUC of 0.92. We've now achieved digital phenotyping of dementia and you know, we can stop here, but we were concerned about this um, because the dementia bank set is small, right? As machine learning sets go, but also because it's not matched. So the cases and controls aren't matched for age or education. So it could be that this model is just detecting more educated younger people or uh, something like that. And so what we wanted to do in this paper was try to interrogate the model to see what it was responding to. And we came up with two approaches to do that. The first we called interrogation by perturbation. And this involved using a set of simulated transcripts or synthetic transcripts of the cookie theft task that had been generated in prior research to simulate the loss of access to um, less frequently occurring terms over time. And so the, the people who created these transcripts started out with a sort of synthetic transcript to represent a normal response and then substituted words that were less frequent for words that were more, more frequent using different um, thresholds of lexical frequency for inclusion as they progressively simulated the dementia. And I'll show you what those looked like in a moment. And then we developed another approach, which we called interrogation by interpolation that involved taking the dementia model and taking the control model and interpolating between them because a trained neural network model is really just a, a bunch of weights, right, or matrices. And so we thought, well, if we started with the control model and progressively added more dementia model, we might see something like a dose effect where the model would become less less perplexed by dementia transcripts as we added more of the dementia model to the hybrid model that we developed. So this is an example example of the synthetic transcripts um, where I've taken an excerpt and I've highlighted some words so you can see how as the threshold for frequency um, is increased, so the words have to be more frequent to be excluded in the transcripts that simulate more severe dementia, you can see a progression from more specific term like a, like a stool to a chair um, or a mother to a, a pronoun. Um, you know, to more general terms that simulates what happens with patients with dementia as they lost to some of their vocabulary is, um, it, it progresses. So um, this is our experimental setup. So the first thing we did was reproduce the work um, that demonstrated this impressive performance using the same library and, uh, that they did. And then we progressed to a different library which had a GPU capacity, so it enabled us to train the models many times. I mean, I think we, in our work, try to, when we can, repeatedly instantiate models like neural network models that have random initialization of their weights to see if the differences we observe are consistent across these stochastic initializations. And this GPU-based um, implementation of LSTMs allowed us to do that. So. This is the first of our interrogation approaches, um, interrogation by perturbation, where we're using these synthetic transcripts that have been developed to simulate DAMIT, to simulate the progression of dementia. And we're looking to see as the simulated progression um, proceeds, how it affects the perplexities of the two different models. Um, and what you can see here is that as we expected might be the case, the dementia model is more, is more perplexed by um, this transcript, which simulates a healthy, pay, a healthy participant, and the control model is more perplexed by the transcripts that simulate a participant with severe dementia. And there's a point that as the simulated progression progresses that they flip around where now the control model is more perplexed and the dementia model is more comfortable with these transcripts. So, um, we also looked with the regression model to see how these models were responding to the lexical frequency of the words that were used in the transcripts from participants. And um, the main point here is that we could see that the control model perplexity increases as the lexical frequency of the transcripts increases, which is to say the control model found very frequent words to be more surprising. And the opposite was true with the dementia model where the dementia model finds infrequent words to be surprising, which is what we'd expect from what we know about how dementia affects language use as it progresses. And so this is our other attempt to interrogate, interrogate the model, looking what we call interrogation by interpolation. And the way to read this is to say, 
if we have a mixed model where the, contribu the contribution of the dementia language model increases as we move from left to right, you can see how this particular model is responding to transcript number three, which is simulating severe dementia. And you can see the mixed model becomes less perplexed by this simulation of severe dementia as you add the contribution of the dementia language model. But there's also a point at which this dementia model becomes more perplexed than we'd like for our modeling for purpose, purposes. And so over here, we, we have um, a model that is entirely the dementia language model with no contribution from the control model. And you can see that it's responding to this simulation of severe dementia. It's finding it more surprising than we'd like. And so we had the notion that maybe we could improve this paired perplexity model by instead of looking at the difference between the control and the dementia model, which would be this difference here, we could look at this difference here, we could look at the difference between the control model and this diluted dementia model, which only had a 75% contribution from the model trained on the text from participants with dementia. And so we found that that did indeed improve performance. Um, we also found that we could improve performance further by using pre-trained word embeddings as a starting point for the model where they had some knowledge of language from an outside source. And we found that the combination of these two things led to the best performance overall. So uh, concluding here, um, we found, we started with this paired perplexity model um, developed by North and colleagues, which um, had been shown to be effective in detecting dementia. But what we showed was the reason why this was the case. So we showed that the models were responding to loss of access to less frequently occurring words, um, which is a, a feature of dementia. And you can think of as a pruning of the leaf nodes of the semantic network. Um, but then as we were doing this research and interrogating the model, we also found that a model that was trained on participants with dementia only would sort of overreact to transcripts from participants with severe dementia and find them more perplexing than was useful for the purpose of diagnostic classification. And so we developed some ways to, to sort of smooth this that led to improved performance. And, um, in our recent work, we've been looking at other ways to approach this problem whereby we've acquired another set of cookie theft transcriptions from um, a study called the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study. And we're looking at the ways in which um, classification with a transformer-based architecture is affected um, or can be improved by using these other data to improve performance on the task in which we have known diagnostic labels. And this raises some interesting issues around uh, class imbalance, but also around um, the issue of confounding bias, where if you have a heavily parameterized model like BERT, where the number of parameters are several orders of magnitude more than the number of training examples you have, and your training examples are drawn from different um, locations that the model could learn to distinguish between those different locations. And so there's some really interesting modeling issues that arise out of that. Okay, so I think by my clock, we have 10 minutes left. So I'm going to um, switch now to the forthcoming attractions and just give you some, some teasers of some, some papers that are in the works to try to attract your attention to them. And so the first of these, um, is a study of a construct that's known as behavioral activation, which is um, a construct that's used in the treatment of depression, where the idea is that people with depression lose their ability to enjoy activities that they found rewarding. It's called, um, the technical term is anhedonia for this. And the idea of psychotherapy that uses behavioral activation is to try to jumpstart their engagement in these activities, which can spark their enjoyment and then have a um, a virtuous cycle of Im improvement in their motivation and then increase their activities and so forth. And so to approach this problem, we started with, our starting point was prior work done with a system called Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count developed by Penna Baker, which is literally, um, as its name suggests, just um, a counting of the words that occur in particular categories. So this is really interesting work. I'm not going to be able to do justice in it in the time that I have, but um, one of the interesting findings out of this work is that pronoun use changes with depression as people become more depressed. Um, they tend to use first person pronouns more because they're more inwardly focused. 
and um, as you might expect, words that suggest positive emotion or affect are used less frequently, and words that expect negative that express negative emotion and affect are used more frequently. Um, this is a very interesting time to be um, to be engaged in research of this nature because nowadays it's common for psychotherapy to be conducted online um, in a text-based setting. So this is research that was conducted in collaboration with Talkspace, who do um, text-based online therapy. Um, and this is increasingly common because not only has it become increasingly accepted because of our isolation in current times, but also there are moves towards insurance coverage of text-based therapy. And so according to Talkspace's website, they have over 5,000 licensed therapists using their platform. It's been used over a million times. Um, and in this work, um, which was led by Hannah uh, Burkhardt, who's one of our students, um, we were looking to see if we could find ways to detect this construct of behavioral activation in online therapy sessions. And so to do so, we used a paradigm for extending LOOC by creating constructs or dictionaries for it using neural word embeddings to find words that are similar to a set of Q terms, which is a paradigm that was developed in or underlies a system called Empath. But um, we built our own because we wanted to use as a training set 2.5 million talk space messages so that our, you know, so the relationships we learned were relevant to online therapy. Um, and so this is just a, a glimpse of some of the findings from this research. So here we're looking at text messages in an online platform from 10,715 participants. And these participants also, as part of other research, um, which is the paper indicated here, were um, administered a PHQ-9, which is a survey of the severity of depressive symptoms. Um, and the PHQ-9 was administered at three monthly intervals. So I'm only showing you the baseline values now. And what you can see here is that our behavioral activation construct is much more strongly represented in patients with milder symptoms and much less strongly represented in patients with severe symptoms, which is also the case for Luke's pre-existing tone construct that captures the, the affect of tone. And so this should be higher in people, I mean, it, I guess you could say high, higher in people who are happier and lower in people who are more depressed as it is. So there's some really strong evidence for Luke's established constructs here as well. And here you can observe the decreasing use of first person pronouns or the increasing use of first person pronouns as depression becomes more severe. So um, you might ask, well, that's interesting baseline results, but how do these change over time? So these patients have been followed at three monthly intervals and the question of how behavioral activation changes over time. Um, and also the question of what this behavioral activation construct adds to the established loop variables are questions that are explored in more detail in the, in the forthcoming paper, but you, know, you will have to read the paper to find out the answer to that question. Um, next teaser has to do with the question of using uh, distributional models to detect suicide risk and so, um, as you, you may know, suicide remains the leading cause of death. And there are some new predictive models that use EHR data that can identify high-risk individuals with some accuracy. But it's difficult with these models to know when the period of highest risk is. And suicide researchers will tell you that risk fluctuates. Um, and this project looks at search log data as an indicator of people's immediate concerns. So maybe people's information seeking behavior can predict not only who is at risk, but when they're at risk. And um, this initial work looks at data that was donated by suicide attempt survivors, which includes their search log history, their Google search history, and in some cases also the attempt dates, so we can start to align search behavior with self-harm behavior. Um, and the way we approached this problem was to work with um, suicidologists to see if we could find ways to model constructs that are known to indicate periods of high risk from the literature um, in, in the context of a semantic space of neural word embeddings. And so um, this is one example from a particular patient. And what you can see here, this is their attempt date. This is a period four months before. And what we've done is we've used our um, models of these constructs that indicate risk according to the literature 
um, to identify searches that are significantly associated with them. And so you can see here um, see indicators of a person reaching out for, for help and also searching for um, means through which to harm themselves and also expressing distress in different ways. And, and there's a period here, which is um, a number of months before in which there seemed to be a peak of activity. Um, and also here you can see um, searches indicating alcohol use, which is known to be a near-term indicator of risk. So, the, you know, the big question here is, well, uh, we can find searches that are concerning, but what we'd like to know is if we can identify periods of time at which care should be escalated because risk is elevated. And so um, in this paper, we go in more detail into our analysis of that, like the difference between periods preceding an attempt and other periods of a person's search history. Okay, so um, in order to conclude on time, I'm gonna move on to some concluding remarks, which is just to say that language use in psychiatric and neurodegenerative disease can be modeled with neural language models. Um, and uh, this can be useful for detecting anomalous use of language for diagnostic purposes, but also um, as a way to monitor mental state, which can be useful for monitoring well, for prognostic purposes, but also to detect exacerbations um, in the context of suicide risk, but also in the context of say schizophrenia, where we know the disease has a fluctuating course. And this is an exciting time to be involved in research along these lines, because there are large amounts of data available for analysis that weren't just a few years ago. So digital traces of online behavior, but also digital capture of um, data deliberately in naturalistic settings using mobile devices. Um, and then of course, if you're interested in NLP, you're probably aware that there are much larger amounts of digital text available for normative modeling. So we're building larger and more sophisticated models of language. Um, and that aspect of natural language processing is progressing rapidly. Um, and so these neural language representations which have shown excellent performance in a range of NLP tasks capture uh, detailed information about normative use of language that can then be used to detect um, differences. Um, so maybe the last parting thought I'll leave you with is as we develop these larger richer models um, that are very interesting to look at as ways to detect differences for normal language, I think it's important to be careful because when you have models that have, you know, three, four, five orders of magnitude more parameters than the small amount or the relatively small amount of patient data you're looking at, there's a, there's a danger of overfitting that I think we have to be especially vigilant about. So there's a need to understand not only that these models can detect differences in language use, but also why they're able to distinguish between cases and controls. And with that parting thought, um, I hope I've left a, a, some time for questions, but if I haven't, uh, please feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to answer, answer any questions by email. Thanks for your time and attention. Trevor, thank you so much. This was incredibly interesting. Um, uh, we really appreciate you joining us. I think maybe we have time for one question and then certainly, um, you know, if, if people could email you with other questions, that would be That's great. Good. Uh, and I should I just to also acknowledge my collaborators and funding sources while you ask that question. Oh, great, yeah. great. So I do see a question posed in the chat from Amanda Moy. Amanda, do you wanna ask your question? Sure, um, thank you for the fascinating talk. Uh, my question relates to if you've looked at bipolar uh, patients with bipolar disorder who are also experiencing psychosis and whether um, looking at uh, global coherence that would be able to discriminate between active schizophrenia and other triggers of psychosis. Yeah, that's a, it's a really interesting question, right? So, you know, the whole question of like how diagnosis works in psychiatry and the fact that a construct like coherence can manifest um, in both schizophrenia and bi bipolar disorder, you know, is a, you know, it's a really big question and something that the NIMH are especially interested in if a construct can be transdiagnostic. So we haven't explicitly looked at bipolar disorder, but I should say that some of the participants who hear voices um, in the context of our data self-diagnose or their self-reported diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Um, and so we do have some data. I think that 
the coherence metric that we have seems to have a stronger association with self-reporting of um, schizophrenia than bipolar disorder. But I mean, maybe the big question that you're asking is, well, how does the construct of coherence differ in its manifestation across schizophrenia and bipolar disorder? And I think to answer that, we'd have to have a, a well-matched data set you know, of people with each condition um, so we, we can meaningfully compare. We don't have that at the moment. Our self-reported data are not, um, you know, they're not sort of gold standard diagnoses for the conditions that people self-report. We do have another ongoing collaboration with a group at UCSF with a psychiatrist by the name of Ellen Bradley, where the data that we're getting um, are data from people who've been clinically diagnosed. And so, but those data focus on schizophrenia. Um, if we got to a point where we had similar data from people with bipolar disorder, I think we could start to answer that question. Uh, thanks for it. Thank you. Great. Well, Trevor, thank you so much um, for joining. And um, we really appreciate your talk. I wish we had more time for questions, but, um, you know, people, people certainly can reach out and email you if they, if they do. So thank you everyone for joining and um, a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thanks very much for having me. Always a pleasure to visit New York and DBMI, even, even virtually. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> we wish it was in person, but absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. Good after, um, have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.